Grand Theft Auto V is probably the most overrated video game in history, with nothing short of endless praise and a rabid fanbase. However, just because something by a lot of people is considered good, that doesn't mean it actually is. So in celebration of this awful game being expanded and enhanced for the millionth time, let's criticize it. Also, if you're new around here, then be sure to subscribe to show your support. I have a Discord if you want to interact with the community. I also have a Twitter if you want to see me discuss more topics and more films. Anyway, Grand Theft Auto V is the game that came out back in 2013 and has been remastered and or enhanced for the almost a decade. Now, while that seems like a long time, you'll think it's even longer if you think of it this way. This game has been remastered since the PS3 era, and we're now in the PS5 era. This game has been getting milked for three fucking console generations. Now, as usual, for these types of videos where I spend long periods of time discussing media, is that I have a set of rules for what I like to look out for in criticizing media. So in this video, we'll be looking out for plot contrivances, conveniences, plot holes, inconsistent characterization, inconsistent world building, pacing, AI, inconsistencies, and illogical decisions. I also have many more, but these are the main things I'm going to be looking for. So now that we've established the rules for this video, let's get on with criticizing it. We start off with our main characters, Michael, Trevor, Lester, and Brad, robbing a bank in North Yankton, where I would say that this is a fine introduction sequence to get the player used to the controls. It's not amazing or anything, but it gets the job done. I guess before I move on, I should also mention one more thing. I hate how when people criticize this game in 2022, they're criticized because the game is now bad for being remastered, and that we wouldn't have done the same thing back when the game was released, which is a ridiculous criticism, because yeah, people criticize things no matter how long it's been, even if they're criticizing now because it's bad now. So fucking what? That doesn't excuse any of the criticisms brought up by the game, it just makes you look petty. Anyway, moving on to the battle with the cops, which is where I should mention my endless hatred for this game's brainless AI. Your companions are literally worthless. If you let them try to kill anyone, it will take them minutes to kill a single guy. Yes, I counted. Once it took 20 minutes for an AI companion of mine to kill one single enemy NPC. This game really wants you to think there is freedom in this open world game, and that you can choose how you want to approach things in this game. Ironically, the game becomes extremely linear for that, barely having any freedom to approach a fight the way you want to. Hell, I've seen more linear games have more freedom and player choice in those games than this massive open world game, especially when it comes down to enemy AI. Jesus Christ, they are fucking brain dead. I genuinely felt insulted when fighting the AI because of how fucking brain damaged they were in combat. Sometimes if you just ram a car into them, they won't even know how to react. Sometimes if you try to get an advantage of any kind, no matter how small, they will still not know how to respond. If I were to give this game's AI a score out of 10, it would probably be a 2 out of 10, because at least the AI works for the most part. It's just that they're fucking brain dead 99% of the time. And no, there's not a single time where the AI is genuinely useful in this game. The AI stays consistently stupid for the rest of the game. Anyway, continuing on with the plot, the team manages to escape in a car, but not when the car is fucked up by the train. Conveniently, no one is hurt from all this collision. Not a twisted arm, not fucking anything. Which if I got fucking decked by a train, at least I would have a fucking broken bone. And it's not like they're in the fucking Batmobile or anything. They're in the same car my fucking granddad uses to go to work. So not really that secure against any head-on collisions against trains. Then Brad gets shot, but plot twist, they actually weren't aiming for Brad. Later on, it's revealed that they were actually aiming for Trevor, and they fucking miss, which is fucking stupid, and if I was the guy who hired that assassin, then I'd fire him on the spot because Jesus Christ's aim is terrible. He could have at least waited for Brad to get out of the way, instead, because of some contrived reason, Brad gets shot. Michael also gets shot too, but of course, Rockstar taking a page out of the most predictable plot twists ever hand guide for hack writers, they decide to predictably have one of the characters have a fake-out death which was probably the first thing that I thought of when I played this game. 
Because it's one thing for a person to die, but when two people die, it just makes it too fucking convenient. Because then it's almost no point in showing this scene. Alright, and also Michael is one of the main protagonists for GTA 5, and it's literally seen on the cover of the game. There's... It's not a spoiler, he fucking lives, obviously. We then get introduced to Franklin and Lamar, who are working for Simeon, the totally legitimate businessman who is definitely not a criminal. Franklin is one of the main characters out of the three you can play from, and while I would say he's my least favourite character, I would be lying if I said that, because every main character in this game is as equally shit as the last. But more on that later, Franklin is a poor man living in the hood, trying to make a living for himself while living with his aunt Denise with all that ass. A small bit of Franklin's story is working for this guy named Simeon, who makes us repossess vehicles for him. And the most interesting thing that happens during these missions is the most surprising thing that no one has come across in a GTA game. You can come across dudes who want to kill you because they are bad. Heavenly Father, I'd like to give thanks for the originality of this game has to offer. To be frank with you, no pun intended, I feel like this plotline is just filler. I guess we do get introduced to Lamar, who is barely mentioned after Simeon's arc. I mean, he's around occasionally for missions, but other than that, eh. I feel like the only reason this plotline exists is so we get to introduce to Michael, because Franklin has to repossess a car, which was conveniently Michael's. Well, technically his son's, but you know the deal. How fucking convenient is that? We then get introduced to Tanya, and her attitude to quitting drugs might as well be my attitude on making this video. You know, I quit. You know what I'm saying? Almost. Yeah, whatever. Fortunately, Tanya's mission is the only side mission required in this game in order to beat the main campaign. So you'd think that they'd have the most premium content available, the most spicy content, for just, you know, getting you invested in the side missions. This brings me back to my next point. The side missions, they're fucking shit. The side missions in this game are probably some of the most boring, monotonous, and some of the worst side missions I've ever played in a video game. And some people may say that you can't criticize side missions, but you can. If it's part of the game, then I'm gonna criticize it. Tanya's side missions are literally towing vehicles and then putting them in a different location over and fucking over again. One side mission forces you to get 50 fucking letter scraps, and when you do, the reward for it is shooting the serial killer who you can easily kill by shooting him in the fucking face. Well, that was worth three to five hours of my time looking for every letter scrap around the city just to find a fucking serial killer. While I do fucking hate Batman Arkham City, at least the Hush side mission was fun, building up intrigue into who's killing these people and it actually makes you feel like a detective. Too bad the ending to that side mission sucked ass though, and it wasn't really rewarding to beat him in Arkham Knight. I don't know, maybe I just hate side missions. I suppose the only side missions that had potential for me was the Lester side missions with Franklin, and the side mission with Trevor where he picks up random civilians and sells them to a fucking cult. Although both of these side missions, while having potential, become extremely repetitive after a while, and when you transform from a main storyline mission to a side mission, then you really see the downgrade in quality. That's usually my problem with a lot of these open world games, is that they don't put enough care into their side missions than they do with their main storyline missions. So if your side missions are uninteresting, boring, and monotonous, then why fucking have them in your game if they're unnecessary? But somehow Rockstar just didn't end the game here. I mean, when I first saw that side mission, I understood why they got nominated for Game of the Year. Although they do have another 40 hours of content or so of runtime, so I guess I might as well press on. Even though this would have saved me so much more time. We now move on to the mission shop, where Franklin and Lamar decide to kidnap a gang member for some fucking reason, and instead of, oh I don't know, planning it out, how they're gonna do it, or at least have some plan in their mind, they're just like, eh, fuck it, can't be too hard. So then they practically ask the gang member if he wants to be kidnapped. They don't even force him. It's like if you plan out a bank robbery, and you say to the receptionist, Hey, can I rob this place on the 15th of March this year? Surprisingly enough, the gang member does not want to be kidnapped today. 
or any day, mind you. So we have to chase after him and politely solicit him. This game also has lessons that should be passed down from generations to generations. Like a shitbox fan that might as well say free candy on the side of the van, of course can keep up with a fucking fast as hell sports bike. And a slightly overweight dude versus a Rottweiler, of course the slightly overweight dude can outrun the dog. So anyway, we waste time with Chop sniffing around for five minutes looking for this guy, and we finally kidnap him. But Lamar uses his phone, so they have to let him go, which I have an amazing thought, you guys. Never been thought before. If you can't go to that location because it's been compromised, then why not move to a different location? I know, genius writing over here. But no, instead this guy gets free and the mission ends there. Wow, that mission was just pivotal to the game, wasn't it, Rockstar? Now moving on to the mission Father Son, where Franklin has now lost his job with Simeon and wants to be mentored by Michael now. When they're about to get a drink together because Michael is a fucking cheap ass, Michael suddenly gets a call from Jimmy that Michael's boat has been stolen. This, once again, is another padded side mission that has nothing to do to service the plot in any way, shape, or form. I mean, maybe you could argue that it gets Michael and Franklin to team up, but come fucking on, there are more interesting ways and better ways to do that than getting a fucking boat back. So once we track down the boat, Franklin idiotically jumps on the windshield and then proceeds to jump on top of a moving vehicle and saves Jimmy. What a fucking waste of time. If you guys really wanted to make Franklin and Michael's partnership occur, then you could have at least have written it in a more interesting way. I guess you could have made the excuse that the reason why this exists is because Jimmy's in trouble, which means that the mission is not just a waste of time, but also used for artificial stakes that don't matter. We now move on to the mission Marriage Counseling, where we find Michael's wife is fucking the tennis instructor. Michael, understandably enraged by this, decides to tear part of his house down, and Franklin comes along too, because let's be honest here, he's got nothing that important to do other than going around watching Chop hump other dogs. So we end up tearing the house down, and the owner of the house sends his goons after us to kill us. But they then end up contradicting that, because now instead of wanting to kill him, he wants him to get $2.5 million for the damages he caused. What? I thought you wanted to kill Michael originally, why are you wanting him to pay up now? Now this game does something which I have named in my Life is Strange video to be a super plot contrivance, so for continuity's sake and to switch things up, I will call this a super duper uber plot contrivance. So this game commits one of the many super duper uber plot contrivances, this is the first one, and it won't be the last. Now you'd think that tracking down Lester, a genius criminal hacker, would be rather difficult, but actually, it's not a problem at all, actually fairly simple, barely an inconvenience. Michael just calls Lester's 10 year phone number, and not only does it work, but Lester picks up on the other line, gee golly. Not only that, but Lester lives fairly close to where Michael lives. Now what are the fucking odds of that happening, huh? Jesus, and I thought Life is Strange was the only one creating the biggest plot fucking contrivances I've ever seen. Which moves us into the next mission titled Friend Request, where we have to help out Lester in order to get our money. So we then buy clothes that look geeky enough for a tech company, and conveniently, when we get there, our disguise works. In fact, it works too fucking well, since one of the workers mistakes us for an actual employee who's competent, who makes us delete porn off of his computer. Now, ignoring the fact that he's an IT computer science guy who doesn't know basic common sense when using a computer, but it turns out the phone we need to bomb in order to progress is at one of the Life Invader branches. You know, not at his home or anything like that, but one of the fucking branches. And if so, then why the fuck is no one guarding it? Nor is the Life Invader dude there in his own space. Conveniently, he just left it there, and Michael manages to successfully plant the bomb device. Although, please ignore the various plot contrivances and illogical inconsistencies used in order to do it like the DNA evidence Michael left on his cigarette, the fact that security cameras have seen his face, was seen by many of the employees who work there, has his fingerprints all over the place, but he also planted fingerprints on the phone which was the device used to kill the man. But he also leaves his fucking bag at the scene of the crime too. Fucking sure. 
Anyway, moving on now to the mission titled Daddy's Little Girl, where Michael celebrates killing someone by watching some good old fashioned TV, but his fucking son, Jimmy, is playing video games upstairs. So Michael tortures him by forcing him into entering the outside dimension, but Jimmy isn't so easily fooled, and distracts Michael by making him look over the boat where Tracy is on. Wow, how convenient that not only Tracy was in the exact location where Michael wanted to go, but was also in the exact location Michael drove to. Now what are the fucking odds of that? Moving on to the next mission, titled Casing the Jewel Store, where we case a jewel store. Very original Rockstar, thank you. Lester hints about the more superior story of Grand Theft Auto 4. There was a, an Eastern European guy making moves in Liberty City, but he went quiet. And taunts us with it. Lester also explains that he knows all of Michael's contacts at the FIB, and that it made a deal to give up his crew to get off Scott fucking free. This causes another inconsistency in the plot where Lester knows that he writes people out to the FIB, still he hasn't changed his phone number and decided to live right next to the fucking guy who writes out people to the FIB for a living, which makes perfectly sense when you think about it. Oh wait, no it fucking doesn't, believe it or not. We then get to the jewel store where Michael is tasked to take pictures of the vent, where conveniently there are no security cameras or anything. Well, isn't that just fucking convenient and really lucky too? So when the day of the heist comes along, all almost goes well, until there's a random guy out there harassing Franklin, which is fucking stupid. Instead of paying attention to, I don't know, the fucking alarms going off or literally anything else, he decides to instead fucking focus his attention with the guy on the motorbike. So after everyone successfully gets away with the heist, everyone is supposed to be lying low to avoid any unwanted attention. But apparently, Franklin became deaf and lost all common sense when Michael told him that because the very first scene we see him in is a strip club where he brags to his friend publicly on the phone about the money he recently acquired. So we then move into the mission titled Long Stretch, where we get introduced to Stretch, a generic bad guy who hates Franklin because of artificial stakes and drama. So we move to the recycling factory to meet our supposed business contact, and Franklin is shocked to see it was the same guy we tried to kidnap back in the mission shop. Jesus Christ, Franklin, maybe stop being a fucking brainlet for a second and ask for the details before you go to start a mission, so you don't get so fucking surprised when the details come forth. Also, another thing that is hypocritical is that Franklin criticizes Lamar for not laying low, when that's the exact thing that Franklin is supposed to be doing, but instead is killing gang members. This is one of many examples of how inconsistently these characters are written, but that's not even the dumbest part about this mission, because the guy we tried to kidnap earlier decides to get locked in a room with his enemy, only to explain that it was all a setup and more people are coming to kill them, and then immediately gets shot by Stretch. I mean, what the fuck were you expecting? Oh yeah, no worries man, you're free to go. Jesus Christ, the writing for this game is fucking terrible. We then move into the mission titled Mr. Phillips, and you might be noticing I'm skimming over these missions fairly quickly. That is because that this video is mostly focusing on criticizing the game, and I expect most of you to have already played the game. Otherwise, I don't know what you're doing here, watching a whole in-depth analysis about why this game is bad. So anyway, Michael and Franklin then get a few drinks to get to know each other better, then Davey comes in and reminds him about Trevor and warns him that Michael is fucked if Trevor knows that Michael is still alive. Conveniently, at the exact same time when Davey says that, Trevor sees the news on the screen and makes the connection that Michael is alive. So enraged, Trevor decides to take down an entire gang by himself, and when I say by himself, I'm saying that because Wade and Wrong are fucking useless. Same goes for every other AI companion except for Chef which is an impressive feat because it usually takes an entire group to take a gang down, but because of the rules of GTA has established, it is entirely possible to take down entire groups of enemies out by just one's lonesome. So I will not be criticizing it for that, since they've already established that's kind of a thing about the game, a little quirk if you will. As an introduction to Trevor about this game, it feels very sudden, like there is supposed to be a scene before that that takes place to introduce him, but it just got cut out. Overall, as a first mission that introduces another main character, it's fine. It could be better, but it's not awful either. Moving on to the next mission titled Trevor Phillip Industries, 
Is it just me, or do these three main characters feel extremely cookie cutter? Franklin is the cool, chill guy, Michael is the damaged teacher, and Trevor is just fucking crazy. Of course there's a bit more to their characters, but I feel like that this is their character like 90% of the time, and it's just so lazy. Franklin is the only one who actually goes through a proper arc where he wanted to be a successful businessman, and in the end, he is. Michael's arc is practically non-existent. His whole thing is that the past is catching up with him, and Trevor doesn't go through much of an arc, nor character development either. He's just there so he can cause stakes and drama for Michael. Anyway, in this mission, Trevor finds a new business partner for himself and meets up with Mr. Chang. Yes, Mr. Chang, pleasure to meet oh, you. No, I am Mr. Chang's humble translator. Mr. Chang now. You speak Spanish, speak it to each other! Mr. Tao Chong is pleased to meet your acquaintance. Oh yeah, he seems it. I'm out. No, don't go! We then drive him to our base, when all of a sudden, Chef tells us that a gang we practically fucked with last mission is coming back. And basically, the whole mission is shoot the brain dead AI, which wouldn't be a problem if 50% of the fucking game was the same thing where you shoot the brain dead AI. We now move on to the mission Nervous Ron, where apparently the gang was here looking for me, sorry, Trevor, however, it doesn't seem like anyone was there for me since the trail looks the exact same as how I last left it, and everyone around me seems to be fine, so this mission is based upon Ron's superstition. Oh that's right, he also sends Wade, you know, the fucking meth head to find out where Michael lives, and he somehow finds him. We then move on to killing some people and dropping off packages, and holy shit what the fuck are these controls for the plane? I swear, this is probably most of my frustration that came out of playing this game, was from the fucking plane segments. They're just so fucking hard to control, and when you do control them, sometimes you'll crash the plane. Sometimes you'll drop your cargo in the area that's a couple meters off. Sometimes the game will just fucking hate you, and it's fucking infuriating. Next mission is Tired of Friends Reunited, where super duper uber plot contrivance number two happens, where Wade has claimed to have found Michael. Michael is the fourth most fucking popular name in all of the United States. The fucking odds of a dumbass like Wade finding Michael, only knowing of his first name, and looking for him through a phone book is about the same chances I have of a girl coming up to me asking if I want to get laid, or all my videos of mine getting no dislikes. It's just not fucking possible, and it pisses me off, but before he goes to find Michael, he has some unfinished business to take care of the bikers. Now common sense would often dictate for these bikers to have moved far away from here, but no, in fact they are in the exact same position from where they last saw them. Then after dealing with that whole ordeal, Trevor decides to move to Wade's cousin house, whose name happens to be Floyd, and that's where the mission ends. We now move on to the mission titled Fame or Shame, where Michael and Trevor reunite. No, surprisingly, the mission titled Friends Reunited was not the mission where they reunite. So story time, Davy is a corrupt government agent who is willing to help Michael in starting a new life, so long as he got credit for taking down the notorious Michael Townley. He was of course targeted with killing Trevor, but Brad conveniently got in the way. Trevor does not know a single thing about this, and doesn't really question it. So anyway, the mission Fame or Shame is about stopping Tracy from embarrassing herself on live television. Wow Rockstar, you guys are sure pushing the limits of interesting storytelling. I mean this mission really need to fucking exist like Chop or any other mission. The mission ends with Michael calling Davey that he needs to meet because Trevor is back, which starts the mission titled Dead Man Walking. Michael and Dave meet, and they both agree to help each other in order to protect Davey's reputation at the FIB, and to keep Michael alive and out of jail. So in order to do so, Michael must check if some guy is alive. So Michael gets knocked out by Davey and wakes up in the hospital. I think it's the hospital, or it might be the morgue. And ironically enough, you don't actually have to check if the man is living or not. You can literally ignore the main objective you were supposed to do, and just leave. 
Anyway, moving on to the next mission titled Three is Company, where we meet Dave and his superior Steve Haynes, who thanks us for confirming that Mr. K was not in the morgue, which is strange since you can literally complete the mission without checking. So this line right here is fucking stupid if you didn't do that. This isn't just some tiny bug, this is a main part of the story, and this is how you progress through these games. So if you didn't do that, then this mission wouldn't be happening. However, we didn't do it, and yet this mission is still happening anyway. Anyway, we are tasked with getting information out of Mr. K, so we do what any sane person would do, so we ask him politely. And by that, I mean we fucking torture him. I mean, what the fuck did you expect? A picnic with Michael, Trevor, and Mr. K? So we get to the top of the IAA building, and we do the flawless plan of going down a government building with a rope suspended from a helicopter in the middle of the fucking day. What an amazing plan! Sounds like any genius could come up with that one. Surely, nothing can go wrong. Did I also mention that the AI for this game fucking sucks? Moving on to the next mission titled Hood Safari, where Franklin, Trevor, and Lamar go to purchase some good drugs. However, the plan goes south, and the man causes goons upon us. And suddenly, they all appear. I guess they were waiting for us or some shit. Anyway, we then get into a shootout, and you'd think that by now the cops would be all over this place, since, you know, mass shootings are something the police take very seriously. But surprisingly, they don't give a shit. That is, until we kill everyone in the neighborhood, and then the police actually arrive. Contrary to popular belief, it's actually super easy to shake the cops. You just have to move in the opposite direction they're going. Now you might be telling me since we are this late into the game, but introverted robot, what bearing does this have on the overall plot? Well, none, you could literally cut all of this out, and the story will remain the exact fucking same. So there's some nice padding for you guys, enjoy it. We now move on to the best mission in GTA history, undoubtedly, titled Scouting the Port, where we take Trevor, Wade, and Floyd to a port in order to scout it. I mean, just look at this thrilling gameplay. Wow, Rockstar, truly the peak of gaming history. I'm fucking with you. This, and the next few missions to come, is probably some of the worst missions I've ever played in a game. I'll explain more in detail later, but for now, let us marvel at this perfection in terms of gameplay. No wonder gaming hasn't been the same ever since that day. After scouring the port and stealing some valuable information, we arrive home to see Wade covered in shit. Such a funny scene, a guy covered in shit, what could be funnier? Fucking nothing else I'll tell you what, I'm just kidding, this has gotta be the worst writing I've seen in a game. This is Adam Sandler tier writing right here, and it's fucking embarrassing. We now move on to the next mission titled Mini Sub, where we steal a mini sub. Truly incredible game design rockstar, I'm on the edge of my seat, and before one of you assholes say that it's set up, and it's supposed to be uninteresting. I'll let you into a little secret. Come, come here. Come close. No, it fucking doesn't have to be, but fine. Let's say in a world where that defense does work, let's see later on what kind of payoff we get for doing the Merryweather heist. We then move on to another mission titled Cargo Bob. Whoa, Rockstar, chill out with the naming scheme. You might actually make me excited over here. In this mission, we steal a cargo bob from a military hangar, and no, we are not supposed to question the logic of that, because that mission is just too high an IQ for us to barely understand, so we dare not question it. Our IQ automatically goes down by one if we do start questioning it. So then we land our cargo bob in the middle of broad daylight where everyone can see. And conveniently, the military just doesn't give a fuck about chasing us when we stole the cargo bob. Anyway, we now move on to the next mission titled By the Book, where we meet Steve Haynes and Devin Weston. What can you tell me that's so different about these characters? Well, one is the same as the other one, except one has a better job position. And basically, we bring out Mr. K in order to find a guy, and we get sent off in a wild goose chase to where we need to know where the location is but not what the fucking person looks like, you know, something you need to know in order to assassinate someone. So yeah, we kill the guy after the two dumbest people alive go on a goose chase with no information. Anyway, let's move on to the Merryweather heist, where we have prepped for everything before we actually told anyone if they were down to do the heist. We just stole a shit ton of equipment, but I guess that doesn't matter. 
so Trevor then tells everyone about the heist for like 10 seconds and doesn't even tell anyone what they're supposed to be doing. But who cares? The next scene, they're suited up and ready to go. I guess playing a heist is old news now. Also, Michael in this mission is a fucking hypocrite. Since Michael is willing to go hours and hours right into the middle of nowhere, and even pilots a helicopter to fly a mini-sub. But then, he says that he's out of the game. Are you fucking stupid, Michael? Ladies and gentlemen, I may present to you the dumbest character in GTA 5. And now begins super duper uber plot contrivance number 3, where apparently a weapon we don't even know what it looks like yet, is managed to be tracked by an app. And somehow, this app knows where it is, and still manages to work in the deepest fucking depths of the ocean. Fucking screw logic, I guess. Time for me to put a bullet in my head to enjoy this. Did they at least test this app? Because this isn't an app made by Lester. This is something that has been broadcasted and advertised on radio commercials. So it looks like you just hopped into the middle of the ocean, hoping that this app would work. Fuck you, Rockstar. So then we steal the super secret military weapon that can be found very easily via phone app. The military then tries to interfere because, you know, because we're trying to steal a super secret weapon. You know, like militaries usually do. They interfere. However, we take care of them and we go back to base. Once we do, we are forced to return it. Meaning that the whole setup and heist was fucking pointless. Now, maybe you can defend some of my criticisms, saying that maybe they intentionally made it that way as a joke. And while that is a stupid way of thinking, since if that's the case, then they are just making excuses for their shitty writing. But even so, you cannot defend this part of the game. You literally cannot. It is a waste of fucking time. And that's all it is. A waste of four hours of my fucking life I'll never get back. Fuck you, Rockstar. I regret everything now. Moving on to the mission titled Hotel Assassination, where Lester asks Franklin, a man he only met fairly recently that he barely knows, and only met him from finding out he was a getaway driver. Knowing this information, he sends Franklin out on a quest, and that is for his first quest, he should assassinate a CEO of a pharmaceutical company. Obviously a smart choice on Lester's part. And then tells Franklin to not look at him. Why does this change anything? So what if he gets looked at by Franklin? That's how they engage conversation, but whatever. Also, Franklin, I know you're in need of money, but I'm sure you can get a bomb or a sniper rifle around your place, right? And also, I know I haven't planned this mission out at fucking all, but just don't talk to me, okay? After that ingenious plan and after Swift's assassination, we move on to another mission that just might be better than the mission scouting the port. And that mission is titled, Did Somebody Say Yoga? Where we do yoga and we get drugged. I'm so happy that the yoga was necessary in the game, because otherwise I don't think GTA will be considered the masterpiece that it is today without it. There's nothing more to say about this mission other than it's fucking boring. Yes, I would love to spend 10 fucking minutes getting used to the yoga controls because of how weird they are, and of course I would love to take a ride along with Jimmy, a fan favorite character that everyone loves. At least this mission actually has some consequences to it. And that's that Michael's wife leaves him for a few missions. Don't worry, she comes back later, like she never fucking left. And we also beat the shit out of the yoga guy. Now we move on to the mission where we have to prepare for the mission titled Blitz Play. To give a summary of why we're doing it, basically we have to steal money from a corrupt organization, then give it to another corrupt organization, which stops a corrupt organization from doing corrupt things. If that wasn't confusing enough for you, then I don't know what fucking will be. We then get our garbage truck, a tow truck, a getaway vehicle, some boiler suits, and finally some masks so we won't be identified. Overall, this mission is fine. It's a tiny bit ridiculous a lot of the time, but that's exactly what I would have wanted when playing a GTA game. A well-established plotline, a plan that has been planned out, and execution. And look at that! It seems like Rockstar can make a good fucking mission after all. Although, unfortunately, the AI still fucking sucks in this mission. And if you actually pay attention, it's just things mindlessly blowing up for five minutes. Just so it can catch your attention, but other than that, not bad Rockstar, not bad at all. But why the fuck did I need to get myself a getaway car when Michael and Trevor escaped, where it is established that they don't have one? We now move on to the mission 
titled I Fought the Law, which actually doesn't have you fighting the law. And we also greeted with one of the worst awkward lines in video game history. Hello. We meet with Devin Weston when his assistant says this. We hear you're a competent repo guy, yes? Oh shit, the one time! Ain't no motherfucking bike in here, man. Oh shit! Come on hey nigga, I would've just got my ass beat over a fucking gunfight! Right through the fucking window. Damn! What the fuck are you doing? You're a competent repo guy, yes? What? Which I gotta admit, made me laugh harder than it fucking should've. And by the look on Franklin's face, I cannot tell whether they were making this serious or not. Anyway, long story short, we get tasked with the mission of stealing some cars from some douchebag rich kids. So we can challenge these rich punks into a race. In the middle of the race, Franklin decides to break in the middle of a highway. A busy one, mind you, which means not only is he a fucking prick, but I also don't see why he had to break to make the call. Anyway, Franklin calls Michael and Trevor, saying that they'll be there soon, which makes me wonder how the fuck did Michael and Trevor manage to get dressed, get donuts, and still manage to catch up with the speedsters with this fucking trash bike. Anyway, we managed to pull over the speed freaks, even if logistically it didn't make any fucking sense, and never should have happened. And I'll admit, I did laugh when Trevor said this line. Whoa, hey, stay in the car there, homeboy. I'll deal with you later. Yeah, fuck you too. I don't know why, it's just fucking hilarious to me. Anyway, we now move on to the mission called Eye in the Sky, where we have to steal another car from a rich douchebag. How fucking original, Rockstar. This surely won't get repetitive at all in the slightest. And we are also greeted with more terrible voice acting. Oh, oh right, uh, the helipad is on the roof. We then start with the next mission called Mr. Richards, where we meet Solomon Richards to discuss a project he was behind schedule on. Wait, why are you all looking at me? Anyway, once we deal with the actor Rocco, we then get hired by Solomon for his help. Can you guess what the mission is about? Punishing a rich douchebag for being a rich douchebag. Wow, Rockstar, you sure are very subtle and not at all hypocritical in your works. We then move on to the next mission titled Carta Libre, where we have to rob someone in order to get some super secret files. Huh, where have I heard that one before? Anyway, once killing the guy and getting the files after we somehow take down the fucking plane via sniper rifle, Trevor also managed to kidnap an anime waifu for himself. Uh, the fuck has happened? Why did he have his car? Man, that piece of turd, huh? No wonder people are stabbing him in the back. What happened? Cheap. Bastard. You know, I really don't know why you mess around with people like that, Mike. I mean, really, I Trevor! don't. That's your fucking question. I asked for a fair day's pay after a fair day's work. Then he kind of got a little angry. So I admit, I kind of got a little angry. Did you kill him? What kind of fucking animal do you take me for? No, I didn't kill him. Oh, fuck. But I did kidnap his wife. Oh, no. To be honest, I respect the hustle, but I will comment on how unrealistic this scene is. I mean, I tried doing the same thing, but instead of a waifu, I got 25 to life. We now move on to the mission titled Deep Inside, which I'm sure the title is referencing to what Trevor is doing with his anime waifu right now, where we steal the last car for Devin Weston. This is the mission where you can just stroll into a movie set and not get kicked out at all by security or anyone else nearby. They'll even be so kind as to let you steal their vehicle prop to take out on a joyride. For some reason, this car has spikes on it that you can use to make enemies spin out of control. Pretty unrealistic of the movie industry if I do say so myself, but that's okay. We then move on to the next mission titled Minor Turbulence, where Trevor the Meth Head decides to take over a military guarded plane extremely easily with barely any inconvenience. If your plane can be taken over by a singular meth head, then you know your military is a shit one. We then jump out of the fucking plane. This mission is bad. 
and a complete fucking waste of time, adding absolutely nothing to the story. We now move on to the mission titled Polito Score Setup, where we are brought a shopping list of things to get. But we don't have enough money, so we waste our time by robbing a bank in order to get enough money for another heist, instead of just, you know, stealing it instead. You guys literally just did it a few missions ago. Oh well, consistent writing wasn't really Rockstar's style anyway. I guess main protagonist would rather leave a fucking paper trail than actually do it safer and more secure, also less risk of getting caught. To then see how good the bank security is, we decide to shoot a bank alarm in broad daylight in the full vicinity of everyone around us to see, and also security cameras to see what we did. They then decide to smartly sit across the road only a dozen meters from whence they originally shot the bank alarm. Anyway, moving on to the next mission titled Predator, where Franklin is tailing the O'Neill brothers because they want revenge for that one time Trevor lit their house on fire like he was from fucking Breaking Bad. So Trevor and Michael then decide to go with Franklin to pursue the O'Neill brothers. But before Trevor and Michael can get there, the O'Neills crash their car, conveniently because a deer ran in the way. But luckily, Michael and Trevor get there, just as the O'Neills start scattering in the forest. Again, the AI in this mission is garbage, I know I've harped on this before, but Jesus Christ, I've never seen such incompetence when it comes to video game AI. When we finally end the O'Neill brothers' lives, which I never saw the point of why this mission needed to happen, they are literally just a few dudes left, not anything bad is going to happen if you just leave them. If you just see what they do in their natural habitat, which is the forest, but it seems pretty convenient to me that only now they want to take their revenge on Trevor, because the last time you blew up the house was probably a few weeks ago, the last time I recall, and all they have to show for their revenge is a car and a few guns. How disappointing, which really shows how incompetent they are. If it took them weeks and all they have to show for their progress is a few guns and a car, then maybe you don't want to kill them because they're quite fucking useless. We now move on to the next mission titled Military Hardware, where the characters really shine this sheer stupidity. Let me explain, in this mission we are stealing gear to rob a bank in order to be able to afford gear for a future heist we plan on doing. Why not cut this part out and just steal the gear for the future heist? There is no point in doing this if we could have just stolen the gear for the future heist in the first place. Anyway, we now move on to the next mission titled The Polito Score, a mission that did not need to exist if we just used common sense. However, unfortunately this is a Grand Theft Auto game where logic and common sense go to die. Anyway, another part of the heist I hate is that when Franklin has the tractor they automatically shoot at him. How the fuck do you know that Franklin is part of the heist? Anyway, I'm done talking about this awful heist, it's, it's just sheer stupidity they would even try to pay for their shit, when it's been established before that they can fucking seal it. We now move on to the mission titled Derailed, where we owe Marta Madrazo a lot of money for stealing his waifu. A reasonable thing to be mad about. We of course derail a train, so once we get our hands on the loot, Trevor says something I've always wanted to say all fucking game. It's perfect. Perfect for fucking what? Next mission we have is Monkey Business, where the gang gets together to try and stop the release of a new virus. No, not that one, a different one. Then Steve says where the fuck the other guys are, and apparently they forgot to tell them this is a six man job, which is dumb. You thought they might have checked just in case, because this job failing can cost them either being labeled as traitors or everyone fucking dying. After some fucking about, we get to the virus, and we carry it on ourselves with no protection at all, because remember, our characters are fucking brain dead. Anyway, we steal the virus and Steve decides to be left behind because people are coming, except that he's forgetting that there are definitely security cameras in the lab, counting his every move, so that was just a fucking dumb thing. And finally, the ending of this mission with Trevor having to sadly return his waifu back to the anime villain of the episode, we now move on to the next mission, titled Hang 10, where we're supposed to meet with lovely Deborah, who for some reason, who isn't very happy that we've been practically squatting in Floyd's house. For some reason, the next scene, we see Trevor, and he's covered in some red stuff. I can only assume that he's covered in jam, because what other red stuff could he be covered in? We then start our next mission titled Surveying the Score, where basically they want to do the biggest heist in history, so to plan out the heist, we just look around the building, and then that completes surveying the score. What a great mission. We then start the mission titled Bury the Hatchet, 
where Trevor figures out that Brad is actually dead and not fucking alive. So a race to North Yankton ensues, and it was indeed Brad, but all of a sudden, we see the triad coming, and Trevor runs away. I don't see how we couldn't just go through the same gate Trevor did, but I guess contrivances need to exist in GTA 5. And in the end, Michael gets kidnapped and is used for leverage against Trevor. I guess they didn't see each other when they were fucking pointing guns at each other and fucking yelling. Moving on to the next mission, titled Pac-Man, where we deliver all the cars we ever stole back to Devon Western. Nothing much more to say about this mission, except it's fine, I guess. We then start off with the mission, titled Fresh Meat, where Trevor reveals to Franklin that Michael has been kidnapped. When hearing about this news, Franklin calls Lester for help. Overall, this mission is a good one, and I like how much stakes there are, since Michael could die if you don't find him. We now start the mission, titled The Ballad of Rocco, where Rocco is upset about the predicament he's landed himself in, so he beats up his boss and runs away when he sees Michael. Michael kills them both and sees what Solomon has done for Michael, which is basically giving him a place in the movie. Next up is the mission titled Cleaning Out the Bureau, where Steve Haynes wants us to follow fucking janitor for us to get blah 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 who the fuck cares. Oddly enough, it is a wonder by how much Lester knows about this guy, yet while knowing so much about him, he doesn't even know as something as simple as an address. Lester, if you are able to find Michael, a presumably dead man, where he lives, then you can find out where fucking janitor lives, you dumb mongoloid. Anyway, we get info from the janitor, and we start the mission titled Reuniting the Family, where we reunite the family together and go get some fucking family therapy. And no, that is not what I meant, you weird fuck. What are you doing, step bro? Weirdly enough, the conflict of this weird as fuck arc gets practically resolved in this mission, and his troubled family life is never really mentioned again after that in missions, and that weirdly ends the mission reuniting the family. Next up, we have the mission titled Architect's Plans, where Lester devises a plan where he can get architect plans for the FIB building. While there's no digital copy, the architect who has designed the building has been carrying around the blueprint for the past 20 years. How fucking convenient is that? So then we get the architect's architect plans, thus getting us one step closer to doing the Bureau's raid, bringing us to the next mission titled Fire Truck, where we of course, obtain a fire truck. Amazing gameplay Rockstar, couldn't expect anything less from you. We then enter as a janitor into the FIB building, and before we do anything, we are seen by many witnesses, security cameras, and we are leaving fingerprints everywhere we go. It's only a matter of time before people make the connection of that janitor showing up only once, showing footage of him only going up to one floor, conveniently where the bombs were placed, and him leaving, with leaving DNA evidence from the scene of his crime. We then commence the raid, and once we get the shit we needed, I get it knocked out from the explosion. Well, thank god for my oxygen mask and protective gear to protect me from all the smoke, fire, and falling debris. Anyway, we now see some guys in this falling building waiting to kill us with no protection at all, who definitely should have died from the smoke inhalation. We then make our way back to our friends, and we descend down an elevator via a rope. But what is the rope connected to? Where did they get the rope? and would even support three dudes with gear on. Anyway, moving on to the mission titled Legal Trouble, Devin Weston pulls the plug on Solomon's movie Meltdown. Conveniently enough, Devin is one of the many shareholders of the company. We then chase after Molly, who's got the only copy of the movie Meltdown. Now remember this point in detail, because it'll bullshit you over soon. Also, when Molly gets sucked into the engine, why doesn't the film get sucked in too? Whatever, fuck physics, I guess. Michael then informs Solomon about Molly, when Solomon tells him that he can't believe we fell for that, since we have digital copies, when he completely contradicts himself, because earlier he said this. Well, you could have told me. I'm sorry, look, I thought you knew. Michael, can you do something? We then start the mission titled The Wrap Up, where Michael wants to try and get Dave and Steve to let him go, so he can stop doing corrupt ship for them. Wow, I wonder how that dialogue piece is gonna go. So when the world's greatest standoff happens, where Davey and Michael have their guns pointed at Steve and the other dude, then all of a sudden the FIB come to. What a fucking twist. And in closing, Trevor saves their asses because he wants to do one last bank robbery? Uh, what the fuck is that logic? Your friend has been lying for you for the past 20 years, and for some reason you're like, I hate you, but let's do this biggest robbery in the world to ever together. 
what? It just doesn't make any sense. In a world with logic in it, Mike and Davy should be dead. We now move on to the next mission, titled Lamar Down, where Tanisha comes in who rightly criticized and broke up with Lamar for being a drug dealing, murdering risk taker. Now hypocritically wants Franklin to risk his life murdering people in a drug deal gone bad. We then go save our ex-friend because our ex-girlfriend told us to. Makes perfect sense to me in terms of Grand Theft Auto logic. Anyway, moving on to the mission titled Meltdown, where Michael goes to his movie premiere, and then we just save our family from Devon's goons. Nothing really special about this mission, so let's move on. We now move on to the mission, planning the score, where the gang has only got really two options, the subtle approach and the obvious approach. The subtle approach is basically where the group hijack armored cars, heading to the depository, take the crews hostage, and infiltrate the depository. Once in, they'll get the score and load it with some modded cars to get out with. This option is by far the most expensive, since you have to bribe someone and pay the whole crew. The obvious approach being the group will cause a distraction out front, while some other guys will be drilling, taking out what they can. Of course, since I'm not a Neanderthal, I choose the obvious approach, because subtlety and heist with this crew isn't a fucking thing. Hell, most of the time they can't even follow basic instructions, and yet here they are robbing the biggest place to rob that's the most secure place in all of Los Santos. Hell, fucking whatever. We now move on to the mission Sidetracked, where Franklin and Trevor steal a plane using a magnet for the heist. And no, do not question the logistics of someone taking a train using a magnet, because of course it wouldn't work. We now move on to the next mission titled Driller, where we have to steal a driller thingy. Yeah, shocking, am I right? Overall, I found these two missions to be pretty goofy, but not entirely unbelievable when it comes to GTA, since this is meant to be a satirical game. And while yes, you could make the excuse that its flaws are satirical in this game, you're basically saying to me, yeah, the writing is meant to be shit. Which at some points, maybe, but other points, definitely fucking not. Like, tell me how the fucking Merriweather heist was not bad because it was satirical. Where's the joke? That I wasted four hours of my life? Haha, <laughs> funny joke game. What's the next one gonna be about? The existential dread that is reality? Moving on to the mission, the big score, where we do the robbery, and to be honest, it's not bad. From the beginning, of they've been wanting to do this heist, and it's not a bad fucking payoff. There's still some shit that's goofy, like this driller machine used to break in is just unbelievably stupid. Overall, it's a good mission, it set out to do what it wanted to do, and it fulfilled the character's motivations and goals from what they wanted to do at the beginning of the game. Now we move on to the final mission, where we can either kill Trevor, Michael, or rebel against the government and kill everyone. This is where the stupid happens, because the first two endings aren't actually canon. So basically, it's a fan fiction. Because what the fuck is even the point of putting the two endings in if they don't actually matter and aren't even fucking canon to your choices? It really just makes me think of it as a garbage way to try and implement player choice. Nice try, Rockstar, but it kinda sucks. The ending where you kill Trevor makes sense to me, since he's a liability, but the ending where you kill Michael just doesn't make any sense to me since Franklin is basically the son Michael always wanted. I think he actually likes and respects Franklin, but Franklin made it seem like he was manipulating, which, no he wasn't, you just came to him about guidance to the crime world. Occasionally he might ask for something from you, but you do the same fucking thing. Did I miss something playing this game? Now, you might be thinking at this point, well the third ending is good, right? It's, it's good, right? Well, I guess, but stop me if you've heard this one before. At the end of the game, you take revenge on all the people who've wronged you, and once you've fulfilled your quest for revenge, you live happily ever after. Have you heard of this ending before? Well, you should've, because it's literally in every fucking GTA game ever with a story. Man, the writers really don't try, do they? There's nothing where anything goes awry. There's nothing to possibly challenge the character, it's just a happy ending. Which is fine, I'm not against happy endings or anything. Bioshock is one of my favorite games, and that game has a happy ending depending on what you do. But the thing is that this ending feels so fucking repetitive, since it's already been done before in the previous games. Are your writers really that dense, where they can't figure out how to write a better ending, or do you think your audience is that dense for thinking they wouldn't notice? To be honest, I can totally understand them if they mistakenly thought their fanbase was a bunch of idiots, and they aren't really fucking wrong. Anyway, what else do I need to talk about before I end this video? The world is incredibly empty and hollow. There's barely anything to do in this world. 
it may look busy, but it's merely a lie to think that there's a lot more to do in the game than there actually is. The side missions fucking suck, the gameplay is awful, the game doesn't try to switch up its gameplay, all it is is just shoot guys in the face over and over again. It gets repetitive very fast. And there you have it. Those are my thoughts on Grand Theft Auto V. Now, I just want to say that if you like this game, it's okay. Don't consider this a personal attack on your tastes. I just wanted to make a video explaining my criticisms. I'm honestly kind of relieved I got to do a video on this game, since I've been having so many thoughts buried in me, wanting to break three. And all this video really helped me with that. If you want to know my rating for this game, it's a 3 out of 10. Thanks for watching. If you made it this far, you might as well like and subscribe. I also have a Discord and a Twitter if you want to become a more active part of the community. And I also have a Clips channel, all will be linked in the description. I really wish I could make these kinds of video essays, but unfortunately, I don't have the time usually. But in a few months time, I should have more time, so more videos will be released in higher quality, and will most likely be longer in length. Anyway, thanks for watching, see you next time where I'll either be releasing my Breaking Bad essay, or you'll be seeing me do a lot of different reviews on games and movies.